apologize for that. Um, the line of Judah gave him the right to be a king. And since he was born from the tribe of Judah, he did not have a connection to the priestly family of the Levites. But if he is going to be our mediator, if he's going to offer the sacrifice that was necessary for our redemption, if he is going to be the Messiah that the Jews uh, will at least follow, then there needs to be some type of priestly connection also. We do not know that until we get to the New Testament, especially the book of Hebrews. So in Genesis, or excuse me, in Luke chapter 3, we have a genealogy. Now there's also, if you can compare these two, there's some similarities along the way. But you have Matthew chapter 1, and you have Luke chapter 3. They are different. They're not the same. This causes a situation. Is the genealogy of Matthew Joseph's line in Luke chapter 3 is through Mary or vice versa? Is Mary Matthew chapter 1 and Luke chapter 3 is through uh, his earthly father uh, through uh, Joseph? So there's a lot of debate. There is nothing conclusive. If you have a Bible, and you may have some notes that are written in your Bible, this may say, normally Luke chapter 3 is defined as Mary's genealogy. Uh, and the reason for that is, we're going to look at the first couple of verses here. Look at um, verse 23, Matthew chapter, or excuse me, Luke chapter 3, verse 23. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age. We mentioned it last week. Why was 30 significant? You had to be 30 to be a priest. Uh, that was to be an active priest. You can be from a priestly family. You can do some of the activities. But to actually function as a priest, you had to be 30 years of age. And Jesus is 30 years of age at this point in time. So it says, it does not say exactly 30. Luke says at about 30 years of age. So we don't know, give her a couple uh, of months there. Being as it was supposed, the son of Joseph. All right? The son of Hillel and the son of Matha. Those, and then the son of Levi. Now this Levi here is not the Levi from the tribe of uh, uh, Jacob or from Israel. Uh, if you'll not get to that until you get down to uh, uh, the bottom, look at verse, um, I'm trying to look and see, verse 33. 33 is an interesting one. Uh, it says, this, oh, actually 32, it says, The son of Jesse, the son of Obed, and the son of Boaz. And Boaz was married to who? Ruth. So you've got the connection there. But then it says the son of uh, Salmon and the son of uh, Nashon and the son of Aminadad uh, and the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, and the son of Judah. So here in Luke chapter 3, we have from the tribe of Judah. This Judah gives him the right to be king. Now flip back to Matthew chapter 1, just for a moment. Matthew chapter 1, you have a reverse. Now in Luke chapter 3, he starts with Jesus, and he lists his father, Joseph, and then Joseph's father, and then his father, his father. So the genealogy starts with Jesus and ends up on the other end all the way back at Adam, who is, the Bible says there in Luke chapter 3, the last verse, it says that he is the Son of God. Matthew gives us the reverse of that. It does not always go, all, goes all the way back to Matthew, excuse me, it does not go all the way back to uh, uh, a, Adam, but it goes back to Abraham. It starts with Abraham. Uh, look at uh, verse 2. Abraham... Well, let me start with one. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, 
the son of Abraham. Now, he is called the son of David. Uh, this was a popular, important messianic title. In fact, many times when you read through the Gospels, you will find that demons called Jesus, even those that uh, had no idea who he was, they, the ones that were inside of these bodies that were possessed, especially the one at the demonic from the Gadarenes, they call him the son of David. Many times those particular demons recognized him when others did not. And so I, I, I know some people say, well, demons, there's no such thing, or some people believe there's no such thing as uh, demon possession and things. I do believe in that. Scripture talks about it. And uh, I've met a few people I, I thought was demon-possessed. So uh, uh, there's, there's some things that uh, uh, we may not understand everything but are true. But they called him the son of David. The son of David is the term that's used here because the Bible says over and over in the Old Testament that David was promised that he would have a son that would sit on his throne, the throne of David, and his throne would be forever. So the son of David also tells us that he was going to be a king. And then you can go through, and you can find some of the same mentions that are given in the book of Luke. Look, read on there in, in chapter or verse 2 of Matthew chapter 1. Abraham begot Isaac, and Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Judah. There it is. And his brothers, Judah begot Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. Now here, Matthew gives us something that's very unique. He gives us four women names that are mentioned here. Uh, four of those, or at least three of those, are non-Jewish. Uh, Tamar, was, uh, she was a Canaanite. She was not a part of that, a woman. Uh, another one is Ruth. What nationality was Ruth? Anybody remember? Moabite, very good. Uh, there was another one, Rahab. Uh, uh, Rahab was, um, uh, she was a prostitute from a country or from at least from a town. Where was she from? Jericho. So you've got those uh, anomalies that sort of stand out there. Uh, but the king of Judah also gave him the right to be king. So when we come to Jesus, we have two chronological uh, listings that tell us that he has the right to be king. Now, one of those is through his biological. Remember, Jesus was of two natures. Our little diagram that we've used. There is one God. The Bible, the great Shema says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. There's only one. But then thou, it goes on to say, Thou shalt love him with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. And throughout the scriptures, he's identified as Father, Son, and in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit is also given uh, divine qualities and, and uh, treated as God and worshipped as God. So the Holy Spirit is also mentioned as God. The Son is God. The Father is God. The Holy Spirit is God. It's not three gods. It's one God. But the triunity, the trinity, gives us the three of these. And the Son is not one-third God. The Father is not one-third God. The Holy Spirit is not one-third of God. They're fully God. That's hard for our human mind to grasp. The only unique thing about this identity is that one day, about 2,000 years ago, the Son actually became human. We don't become gods. He became human. And so he is called the God-man. He is 100% God and 100% man. Now, the reason I tell you that is he had an earthly mother, a biological mother that supplied part of his genetics. 
The Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon her and she conceived. So part of his genetics came directly from the Holy Spirit, just as God created Adam and Eve in the very beginning. The Holy Spirit creates whatever is necessary for Jesus to be conceived in the womb of Mary. So his mother um, gives him the human uh, part and his father, his earthly father gives him nothing but his heavenly father gives him the divine nature And so he is both God and man. Now, which genealogy is the one that we want to figure it out? I'm not going to read through this because it has a lot of names and it's just a matter of... Each of those names are important. You can go back and figure out what each one did in the Old Testament. But there's an interesting little clue at the very end of this genealogy list here in Matthew. Look at verse 16. It says, And Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now, if you go back to Luke, hold your fingers there, Matthew chapter 1, and look back at Luke 3, there is a situation here that says at verse 23 or 24 there, uh, well, no, 23. It says, And being about 30 years of age, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Hillel, who the son of Matthew. So Joseph is listed here as two different fathers. Now, there's got to be an explanation for this. The Bible does not make mistakes. Sometimes people make mistakes in copying. But what is the distinct difference here? There is another clue that helps us. If you will look back at Matthew chapter 1, look at verse 17. and says, So these are all the generations of Adam to David, or 14 generations. So if you started call, uh, counting out from Abraham down to David, you would find that you would have 14 generations or 14 men that's listed. And then he goes on to say, the writer here in Matthew says that from David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations, and then from the captivity in Babylon unto the Christ are 14 generations. This was so that they could memorize. There are 14 names, then 14 names, and then 14 names. You've got them probably, if you have a study Bible, they're broken off into groups. Verses 2 through... Um, uh, King David starts off about halfway through. Uh, I can't even see what the name of the, what verse it is. Verse five or six. Uh, that's where King David comes up, and he was born through. Or King David begat Solomon by her who was of the wife of Uriah. That's Bathsheba. She was uh, uh, not even of uh, uh, Jewish descent. Also, if you count there from David or from Solomon and go all the way through to Babylon captivity. There in verse 11, it says, Josiah begat to Jeconan and his brothers about the time they were carried away to Babylon. You would find there's 14 names. Hang on with me. Now, at verse 12 through 16, you have some other names that are mentioned, but if you start counting them and, and count Joseph, you will find that Joseph is number 12, and then Jesus would have been 13. You can go back and count those later on. But those names are important because they give us a little clue. The wording that we have in the English is a different word that's used in the original text. Matthew actually wrote in Hebrew. The book of Matthew is one of those rarities of the New Testament. The New Testament is mostly written in Greek, but Matthew wrote because he was writing to the king of he was writing to the nation of Israel specifying that Jesus has the right credentials to be the king. The statement that's made here in verse 16 says this, And Jacob begat Joseph, it says, the husband of Mary. But actually, that word husband is a different word 
than normally is used for husband. It can also mean the father of Mary. Now, I'm not going to get in a whole lot of discussion tonight, but if you're interested in debating this later on, we can talk about it. But I personally believe that Matthew is probably the genealogy of Mary because if you put Joseph as number 12, Mary would have been the 13th generation and that would have made Jesus the 14th generation, which would have made the next statement correct. So it's better to uh, at least to understand if you want to say, no, it says husband, I'm going to count him as a husband, then you can still try to figure this out. But the question comes, why can he be or how can he be a priest? I mentioned this briefly the other night, and this is what is important tonight as we look at this. To be a priest at about 30 years of age, Jesus had to have their credentials. Now, if you've got your Bibles, we're going to look at the major part of our scripture tonight. Find the book of Hebrews. Pages are stuck together. All right, there's whole sections here on verses uh, uh, chapter 7, starting in chapter 7, uh, and chapter 8 talks about being a priest. Now, the book of Hebrews was written to explain a whole lot of things that are written in the Bible that we may not understand unless we understand from a Hebrew mindset. And the priest is one of those high, very important place or important people that we need to understand, especially the high priest. The high priest of the Old Testament was to be the mediator between God and man. In the temple or in the tabernacle before the temple was built, the people were not allowed to enter into the tabernacle or even the temple. Only the priest could serve in the temple. But when a person had a situation and needed to make some type of confession of their sins, they would come to the tabernacle door and they would talk to one of the priests and if necessary, one of the other priests would go and fetch the high priest and he would come and they could actually talk to the high priest. The high priest could then, or one of the priests, could go into the tabernacle or into the temple area and make concessions. If there was a necessary offering to make, if he had cheated his neighbor out of uh, two goats or whatever, he'd had to sacrifice and then repay back to his neighbor uh, what he had taken. And so all of these laws are listed here in the book of Leviticus uh, in the Old Testament, which very few people read because it sort of uh, gets bogged down unless you understand the Hebrew. But here in chapter 7, we find an interesting connection. Jesus is not a priest after the tribe of Levi. We find that he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now, if you were looking at a chronological statement here, or at least the idea of when these events happen, about 2000 B.C., you had Abraham. Then you had his son Isaac, and then his son uh, Jacob and Esau, and then Jacob had those 12 sons. And so this is where you come in with the tribe of Levi. Abraham has a relationship with Melchizedek and is found in the book of Genesis. Turn over, hold your finger here. I like to hold your finger. But uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and turn over to the book of Genesis. Lot, who is Lot compared to or in relationship to Abraham? His nephew, very good. Lot, his Abraham's brother, uh, has died and died actually before they left uh, the original Ur of the Chaldees and he brought his uh, nephew with him, Lot, when he was very young. And Lot was taken captive. And so uh, uh, he had to be rescued by 
Abraham himself. And so Abraham goes, he takes all of his men with him, and uh, they make uh, war against those that had stolen, math, or stolen Lot, and he wins the war. His men that are with him are great in number and powerful, so they get Lot back. And so Abraham is headed back to his, his homeland, back into the promised land, and here in Genesis chapter 14, we find the relationship of what happens here. Uh, after uh, Abraham has defeated this, uh, then Abraham or Abram is headed back. Look at verse 18 of chapter 14. It says, when Melche Then Melchizedek, king of Salem. Now, Salem. is where you get later on this very city of Salem they add a name to it and it becomes Jerusalem Salem also means peace or like we would call or the Hebrews would use the word shalom and it means peace and this is sometimes understood as city or town of peace so Melchizedek, long before Jerusalem becomes an established city, at this point in time, it is a uh, Jebusite uh, stronghold, but it's still called Salem, or peace, and Melchizedek is there. In fact, it says, Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Bread and wine, significant, because later on, in fact, we practiced it this morning through the Lord's Supper, they had bread and wine. It was a symbol. Um, if you got a new house or if you wanted to uh, provide somebody with a meal that would give them some uh, type of strength or revive their, uh, their uh, spirits a little bit, you would give them bread, which was a very important staple for every generation, no matter where you are. Every culture has had bread. If you're in Southeast Asia, that may be rice bread. Uh, if you go from other where it may be a, a different type of bread, but bread is always a, a worldwide staple. Um, not trying to make any predictions, uh, but one of the bread baskets of, uh, uh, of the world, especially for Africa. Africa has very few uh, wheat fields. Uh, they don't have the right temperature. But one of the prime places that uh, wheat is produced is the Soviet Union and the Ukraine. And right now, for the last three months, they have been at war. And so there's probably going to be a great, great problem with getting food, especially for the African countries. Now, here in America, we probably won't even feel the effects of it. But other people in the parts of the world, they're going to be suffering because of the lack of bread. And so their substance is going down, but bread is an important part. And wine, which was an um, uh, important drink because... Uh, many times the water was not as pure, so the wine actually acted as an antiseptic type. And also, it does uh, uh, you know, alleviate the pains and aches of mankind. So um, they, he serves bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. Priest of God Most High. What's uh, God's Most High? What's his name? What, what do we, what's the Bible say is his name? I am... Or Yahweh. I'll get it right in a minute. I'm looking for my right here. Yod Hey Vav Hey, and then you put all the uh, uh, vowels in there. Uh, you can, if you spell it Jehovah which would be, instead of a Y, it would be a J, but you get... Uh, you get the vowels, E and O and A, and you get Jehovah. But Yahweh, we can remember it as yod Hey vav Hey in the Hebrew. But the, this is the name that he gave to uh, Moses there in the burning bush. That This is Yahweh... The, the most high God. In fact, remember, I'm telling you a whole lot tonight, so follow with me if you can. There's a lot of gods out there. 
None of them are creators. They are all created beings that God created that have rebelled against him, but anyone of a divine nature could be called an El or an Elohim. God distinguished himself from all of the other Elohims by saying, I am the most high of these. In fact, that's where we get the term. Uh, there the first of the Ten Commandments says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Because there were other false gods that other cultures have worshipped for the last six um, millennial. They have been worshipping false gods. Most of those gods, uh, many of those gods are just in name only, but some of those are actually named in the Bible gods that acted in different places at different times. Most of them acted evil. I, actually, I would say that all of them acted as evil beings, those that had rebelled against God. The Bible also says this, at the, turn, at the time that Christ will return, that there will be uh, similar to the, as it was in the days of Noah. And so there may be um, uh, a resurgence of these types of evil beings that are coming back. I don't know. I can't specifically say this is it, but uh, it sure looks like a lot of those gods are coming back into the forefront of people's lives. They're worshiping all types of wickedness and evil. Uh, we see the... the killings and all the things that's going on around the world, uh, wars and murders and hatred and fussing and fighting and even in uh, places here in America you find uh, evil. And so these gods, these false gods are in fact their whole purpose is to do this. They want mankind, they want you and I as human beings to worship them. And they want us to leave God. And God says, you will have no other gods before me. That's the battle. I've mentioned this before. God, Satan does not care if you worship God as long as you worship him also. If you give him just a small portion of your life, Satan is satisfied with that because God says, I'm not going to take part of you. I want you all. We've got to worship him with all of our mind or with all of our soul and with all of our strength and all of our spirit. That's the only way God wants us is we've got to give him our all to him. But Satan says, no, just give me... You, know, you can give God uh, one day a week and just give me the rest. Or even uh, give me a couple of hours a week and you can give God the rest of the time. He knows if you compromise and give him just a little bit, he's got you all. So Yahweh, Jehovah, Jehovah, however you want to pronounce that, uh, he is the Most High God. Now going back to our scripture here in Genesis 4, it says... Uh, he was the priest of God Most High, Elohim uh, Almighty, or El Shaddai, I guess if you want to call that. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, a tithe of all. And the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the, pers uh, the persons, all those that you captured, and take the goods for yourself. That was the goods or the spoils of war. But notice what Abram said. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham or Abram rich. So God or Abraham meets Melchizedek. Now, flip back to Hebrews chapter 7. Actually, there's a couple of verses in the book of Psalms, and we'll look at that, Psalms 110. Uh, but we'll talk about it because it's also written here in Matthew or in Hebrews chapter 7. All right, going back to Hebrews 7, verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth of all, he gave him a tithe, first being translated king of righteousness. Uh, Melchizedek. Uh, Melech in Hebrew stands for king. 
Sadik is righteousness. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness, but he's also known as the king of peace or the king of the city of Jerusalem or Salem. So he's got a lot of explanations. His name means king or melech of righteousness. Jesus is also known as the king of righteousness. He's the only one that can give us righteousness. Nowhere else in the scriptures is someone called the king of righteousness. So going on here, uh, looking at verse 2. To whom also gave uh, Abraham gave a tenth of all, being translated king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither the beginning nor the end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continuously. So Melchizedek does not have a genealogy. No father, no mother. But it also says that he has no beginning of days nor end of days or end of life. And he's made like the son of God or the son of the, of the highest. So here we have an, a basic understanding that probably Abraham, when he was coming back from war, met a pre-incarnate person of Jesus Christ. Jesus took on many forms in the Old Testament. He wrestled with Jacob and uh, put Jacob's uh, hip out of joint. Uh, he met, in fact, if you read the whole uh, story of Moses and the burning bush, you will find that Jesus is there. He is there in the midst. Yahweh is. Uh, he is in the midst, and he's speaking for it, and he sees a form like a man. So he's called the angel of God also. Uh, when he went through the children of Israel, um, when they were down in Egypt and went into the houses of the Egyptians and killed the firstborn, it's called the angel of the Lord. Well, sometimes he's called the angel of death, but he's called the angel of the Lord, and that's probably a pre-incarnate form of Jesus Christ. Let me back up just a second and say this. God, let me, I'll take this box here. God created the universe. If we were to take everything that scientists know about the universe and put it in this box, all of creation, you've got everything inside of this box. God stands out, the creator. Now, if you're Hindu, you believe that God, Brahma, is a part of creation. In fact, if you are a pantheist, you believe that the creation or the nature itself is the creator. And so there's a lot of people that understand a different understanding of who God is. The Bible teaches that God stands outside of his creation. He can look into his creation, and if he wants to, he can even enter into his creation and I guess you could say interact with the people that are there. <laughs> I hate to throw out little junk that's probably worthless but if you were ever a Star Trek fan I was not a big fan but I have read a little bit and seen a little bit Star Trek does anybody know what the prime directive was anybody know if you're a Star Trek fan you probably know what the prime directive was the prime do what search out new worlds okay that part of, but their prime objective is a little bit more than that it means that they will search them out, but they're not going to interfere. Interfere in any way in what they find. If there's a war going on, they're just going to observe it, stand off at a distance. Of course, that never happened. The TV show, they were all messing up and getting in there and, and fouling things up. If you've ever heard of the butterfly effect, if you change one little thing here, it affects all of the future or whatever. They were told uh, their prime directive was that they were not to interfere at all. God's prime directive was not was not that his prime directive was to love mankind and so any time that was necessary god would step into his creation not just at the birth of jesus 2000 years ago but on many cases in the old testament god would step into his creation and interact 
with those that he loved. And he did that. He, you know, Balaam, that one that talked to his donkey, uh, you know, the angel of the Lord stood beside of him and he saw the angel guard. Uh, there's multiple places that Jesus shows up, or at least God in human person, and we usually understand as the Son, He is the God man. So if God shows up in human form, we understand Him as Jesus in the Old Testament, even before He was born. That's why it's called a pre incarnate form. He interacts with His creation. He did that with the priest, He did that with the, uh, the prophets of old. He stepped into history. And he affected history. He changed history. He changed it greatly 2,000 years ago, so much so that we even changed our calendars to talk about him entering into history as a human being. So God, he stands outside of his creation. But he can enter into as a man, and he did that on many, many occasions, especially as the man of God, or the Son of God as he became human. Now, the reason for that is, is because God loved us. So, a lot of people say, well, I object to Jesus being called or understood as Melchizedek. There's no explanation, there's nothing else in Scripture that would tell us who this Melchizedek was other than this little spot here in Hebrews chapter 7. He was, had no father, had no mother, no genealogy. He had no beginning and no end to his life. And he was like the son of God. And so we have to assume that Melchizedek that met Abraham. And if you remember Jesus when he was in the New Testament, the Pharisees were questioning Jesus. And they said, um, uh, uh, Jesus said, uh, uh, he, he gives the analogy. He says, yeah, I can just, this, if this temple is destroyed, I can build it back in three days. And they say, oh, that's impossible. You can't do it. And he goes back to his father Abraham. He says, Abraham saw my day in his time, and he rejoiced in it. And they said, wait just a second. You're, how old are you? 30-something years of age? You're not old enough. You can't remember when Abraham. And he said, Abraham saw my time in his day. And so Abraham, I believe, encountered Jesus Christ as the person of Melchizedek. Now, let's read on here. We've got a few more minutes. Let's read on here in Hebrews chapter 7. Then if you've got a question or two, I'll give you a chance. Uh, look at verse 4. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth of the spoils. And indeed, those who are of the sons of Levi who received the priesthood uh, have a commandment to receive tithes from the people. So he's comparing, he says the Levites could receive a tithe, tithe and Melchizedek received a tithe. So he must have been an important priest. Going on there, he said, um, uh, though they had come from the loins of Abraham, but he whose genealogy is not derived from them received tithes from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. Now beyond all contradiction, the lesser is blessed by the better. Here mortal men receive tithes, but there or there he receives them, meaning God, of whom is witness that he lives. Even Levi, who was the priestly tribe, who received tithes, paid tithes through Abraham, so to speak, through his genetics. For he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. See, Levi, it was four generations when uh, Abraham met Melchizedek. Verse uh, 11, Therefore, if perfection were through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, could you get saved by keeping the law? Uh, you know, that's a question nobody really knows the answer. Uh, probably not, unless you were perfect. And the only person that's been able to do that was Jesus. So a person... A human being could not keep the law to perfection. They always broke the law in one manner, and the scriptures say it in the New Testament, for all have sinned. So no person can be saved through the law. He says, What further need was there that another priest should rise according to the order of Melchizedek and not be called according to the order of Aaron? 
For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there is also a change of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken belongs to another tribe, from which no man has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord arose from Judah, he's from the tribe of Judah, of which tribe Moses spoke nothing concerning priesthood. As it is yet far more evident, the likeness of Melchizedek, there arises another priest who has come, not according to the law of the fleshly commandments, the Ten Commandments, but according to the power of an endless life. For he testifies, and this is a quote from Psalms 110. It says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. That is in a messianic uh, statement in the book of Psalms. It says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, there is an annulling of the former commandment because of its weakness and unprofitableness. For the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the beginning of a better hope through which we draw near to God. And then he goes on to talk a little bit more about the priest. Look at verse 20. And inasmuch as he was made or not made priest without an oath, for they have become priests without an oath, but he with an oath by him who said to him. So God is talking to himself or talking to the Lord there. The Lord, and remember that capital L-O-R-D is that word uh, uh, Yahweh there. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. By so much more, Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. The word surety is like a um, if, uh, if Andrew were to take out a loan and he's never had borrowed money before, Tony would have to go down and sign for him. That's, he's, uh, Tony's signing a guarantee that if uh, Andrew does not pay it, he will pay it. And that's what Jesus did. He says, these humans can't pay it, but I'm a surety for them. I will pay it, a guarantee for it. Continue on. Also, there were many priests because they were pre uh, prevented by death from continually. But he, because he continues forever, he has unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he, this is Jesus, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Who does not need, who does not need daily, as those high priests did, to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins. Every priest that went before the Lord or went into the temple, he had to bring his own sacrifice, cleanse himself first, and then come into the temple to offer the sacrifices for others. But Jesus didn't have to do that. He says, for he, once for all, when he offered up himself, for the law appoints as high priest men who have weaknesses, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who has been perfected forever. And then he goes on and talks some more uh, about the law uh, of the priest or what the priest does. Um, we're not going to have enough time to cover everything I'd like to. But Jesus is the only one that fits both characteristics. It had to have been not a priest from the tribe of Levi, but it had to have been a priest after Melchizedek, but he also had the genealogy that made both of his, both of his mother and father, whichever one is which, he is still from the tribe of Judah, which gives him a right to the throne. If a Jew came forward today and claimed to be the Messiah, the very first thing they have to ask him, okay, show us your birth certificate. Show us your credentials. The word priest, there are some priests that were available that came back from Babylon. Uh, if you know somebody named a Cohen, in fact, there's a lawyer in town here, it's Cohen. Uh, that's what the word Cohen means. It means, uh, it means from the priestly tribe. But there's nobody that can connect to also being a priestly tribe and also from the tribe of Judah. 
There's no credentials that would give you that. The only birth certificate was written 2,000 years ago here in Matthew and Luke that gives the correct credentials for Jesus Christ to show up. In fact, here's what, turn, turn in your last little section here. Turn to uh, Zechariah. In the Old Testament, it's right near the end of the Old Testament. Here's what Zechariah says. Uh, Zechariah chapter 13. Look at verse 2. Zechariah 13 verse 2. It shall be in that day, says the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land. He's going to destroy all these false gods and remove their names. They'll be mentioned no more. And they shall no longer be remembered. All of these false Satan himself, all of uh, the other types of gods that are mentioned, uh, Moloch, Baal, Astra, all these that are mentioned in the scriptures, these false gods, he says, I'm going to cut them off, cut off their names, and they'll not be remembered. I will also cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to depart from the land. It shall come in the land of Israel we're talking about. It shall come to pass that if anyone still prophesies, then his father and mother who begat him will say to him, You shall not live because you have spoken lies in the name of Yahweh. Or the Lord and his father and mother who begot him shall thrust him through when he prophesies stick a, a sword through him and it shall be in that day that every prophet will be ashamed of his vision when he prophesies and they will not wear a robe of course uh, excuse me a robe of coarse hair to deceive you know John the Baptist he wore uh, uh, camel's hair uh, but he will say I am no prophet I am a farmer for a man taught me to keep cattle from my youth. And one will say to him, What are these wounds? Now this is the, the, the part here that's important. What are these wounds between your arms or in your hands there? Then he will answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. This is the prophecy of Zechariah, that the Jews, when the Messiah shows up, there will be people that will realize We've been waiting on our Messiah, and then when he holds out his hands, they're going to see the nail prints in his hands. And they're going to realize that the Messiah they had been expecting, that they killed Jesus for, was the very Messiah that they had been waiting on, and here he was. And they are going to have that opportunity to accept Jesus as their Messiah. And there are Jews, as I said, there's a lot of people that are secular Jews, but the Messianic Jews have trusted in Jesus as their Messiah. And you and I have too. I hope you have trusted Jesus as the Messiah, not only of the Jews, but also us. He, as he said, he is the priest. He's the mediator. We don't go, if you're Catholic, you have to go to a priest to confess. You and I go to who? Jesus. He is the high priest. He comes to us. He gets the information, and he mediates between us and his Father, and then he comes back to us and tells us his word. But you know something else, too? The Bible says that one day, in the book of Revelation, it says it twice, that you and I will rule as priests and as kings, not taking his place, but ruling as heirs and joint heirs with Christ. We will have the privilege through his righteousness to be able to be called priest. You and I, you may not be born from the tribe of Levi, but if you're a born again Christian, just like the order of Melchizedek, Jesus was not born through the tribe of Levi, but he had the right to become a priest. And our Father, Jesus Christ, he will also make us have that same right. You and I can become priests and kings. We will have a dual uh, relationship. We'll be sons of Abraham, but we'll also be from the tribe of Judah, and we'll have a certain amount of kingship, and we'll also be a priest. 
just to show you that, turn to uh, Matthew, or excuse me, Revelation chapter 1. And I promise I'll, I'll finish with this one. Revelation chapter 1, verse, um, about verse 6. If I can find verse 6, somewhere in there. Uh, it says, To him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood has made us kings and priests of his Father, uh, of his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. It also says that in Revelation 26. You and I, if we are a born-again Christian, you need to realize that everywhere you go, you are acting as a representative of Christ, as a king and a priest. And we need to act like it and be like Jesus. And even though we don't have the right birth credentials, through Jesus we have been born again and have been given the rights to be priests and kings. You have about one minute. Anybody have a question? I didn't give you enough time. All right, no question. Let's pray. Father, oh, the Bible is a wonderful book. Not only does it tell us truth, but it is truth. It is the only truth that we can trust because all other truth is based upon fallible men that have made discoveries or made statements or have invented things. But Lord, you're the only creator and you are the God most high. You are the Elohim, El Shaddai. And so, Father, we trust you and promise that we'll live for you each and every day because we are kings and priests that want to glorify you for you have the dominion forever and ever. Father, let us live like kings and priests, not in the grandeur, but in a godly way of being godly people that others can see Christ living in us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. And you are dismissed.